Welcome to CMO TV Live, a production of Accent Infomedia Private Limited. We have been interviewing the CMOs to understand their challenges and their storytellings. Uh, today, my guest is uh, Stacy Epstein, who is the Chief Marketing and Customer Experience Officer at uh, Service Max. In uh, this role, Stacy is responsible for making a meaningful long term impact of Service Max customers across all areas of business. Stacy is an accomplished go-to-market expert with two decades of cloud, social, and mobile enterprise technology experience. Previously, Stacy uh, served as uh, CEO of Jink, uh, which was acquired by ServiceMax in 2019. Prior to Jink, uh, Stacy was CMO at uh, ServiceMax, where she helped Wheel of five consecutive years of triple digit growth. Prior to that, she had held a leadership roles in various companies, including Oracle, Clarify, Success Factor, which got acquired by uh, SAP later on, and Service Source. Uh, Stacy, warm welcome to you, and thank you very much for sparing time from your busy schedule. I understand it's too early in the morning. Thank you once again. Well, it, it's it's 6 a.m. here. It's time to get the day going. All right. Let Thank us you start. For me. So it's my pleasure, Stacey. Uh, my first question is: let me understand, let me uh, ask you a question about uh, Service Max. If you can throw some light on the company, what is the company into uh, and what is the coverage area geographically? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I'll start. We are absolutely global. We are in every corner of the world. Um, in fact, our ta tagline is that we help our customers keep the world running. And we do that by enabling field service teams and organizations with technology to help them keep all of the most important assets of our, of our world up and running. So when you think of the white vans out driving on the road that have people that are going to sites to fix um, issues, to make sure that machines are up and running and are running effectively so that they can um, maintain them and, and fix them before they even break. Um, that's what field service is. It's going to a site where something might have an issue that is too big or important to um, have the customer, you know, tinker with and fix themselves or wrap it up in a box and, and send it in for fixing. So we're talking about MRI machines and hospitals. We're talking about oil rigs. We're talking about the power grid. We're talking about, again, the world's most important assets that keep our world running. Our technology enables field service teams to fix, maintain, install, repair, those those machines and we do it for um, some of the most important companies in the world especially right now while we're still in this pandemic um, you know obviously having those those systems those hospital machines those ventilators the the lab equipment um, the 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 needs of our world are are really serviced by field service teams and we do that uh, we're built native on the salesforce CRM platform. So this field service solution is tightly coupled with Salesforce's CRM, handling the service and the sales side of the business. Um, and that's what we do. All right. So you know this situation, the time is not that conducive, that good. Nobody is getting out of their homes. So what is the market sentiment now, Stacey? Well, I think it's really changed. And I think COVID came one could look backwards and say it came slowly, but I think at least, you know, in, in the non-China part of the world, it came very quickly and suddenly the, you know, within a matter of days, the entire world was just shutting down back in March, seems like forever ago. Uh, and in the beginning, I think the field service industry got caught a little bit on its heels, as did the rest of the world. I don't think any of us thought there would be that there could be something so um, so big and powerful to us basically just shut the world down. Again, remember, 
the customers that we serve keep the world running. And when the world is shutting down, um, that's a, a huge development uh, as it was for all of us, but especially for them. And I think the world then slowly started to reemerge. I, first of all, when the world was shutting down, there were still essential services that had to stay up. And if you think of the machines and the equipment that I described earlier, those were the ones that became even more important, the hospital machines, the power grid, even things like our, our satellite TV became really important because everybody mm. was home and we needed ways to connect, internet service. So a lot of our customers got pushed into overdrive with their business. Uh, and then we have customers who serve the retail industry. They serve the restaurant industry. They're going to restaurants and, and servicing the lighting and heating machines or pieces of equipment. They got shut down. And so I think you had this, this you know, either you were in overdrive and you better figure out how to ramp up the production of whatever it is you service and sell by four to 10 times, or you were in this situation where you were having to furlough employees, you had to figure out how to keep your company alive. And we saw that for sure right away with our customers. I think the customers that our customers, and when we look out at the industry as a whole, beyond even our customer base, the ones who were far along in digital transformation are the ones that were easy, were uh, better equipped to respond. And so if you had to ramp up production, uh, you have a, a system that helps you track all the activities, all of the assets, all of the warranties, all of the contracts. You understand when was the last time that machine was fixed? Is it going to need fixing? Even more sophisticated technologies like remote service, the ability to, from an IoT perspective, understand what's going on with that asset. I, I, I would rather not send my technician there because of the risk of the pandemic. So are there things I can understand about the machine from, from my office? Are there ways that I can fix it? Um, are there ways I can predict what are the machines that are most likely to go down so that I can focus on only those? Uh, but it, it goes even further. I think it hit every, every area of our business. You talk about these essential workers that literally had to continue to go to their job. How could we help them be more safe? So adding checklists to our technology to make sure that with these new protocols, technicians knew exactly what they needed to do and they could fill out a checklist in the product. Um, other seemingly not minute things, but typically at the end of a work order, a technician asks for the customer to sign on the iPad. Well, we don't want 10 different people touching this iPad. And so the ability to add a little checkbox where the technician said, yes, my customer agrees that I will check this box and they don't have to touch the iPad. I mean, they seem like very, very small things, but when you're a big, large company with a very large workforce making those changes without having already transform your digital practices is really hard. So the ones that had already embraced digital transformation and had moved ahead were the ones that were able to quickly respond. I mean, we had customers like Medtronic that were doing four times the production that they had done pre-pandemic. And, you know, you heard their names being talked about in the news very frequently. They were very much at the center of, of, uh, of the fight of building ventilators. Uh, you know, we have medical labs with lab equipment that is on overdrive trying to find a cure. And, and those operations, they need technology. And mm. in, this, in the challenges that we face, technology really was a major differentiator between the ones that were able to step up and rise to the occasion and the ones that were just caught flat-footed. Stacey, uh, you know, there has been a, a paradigm shift in the uh, business, as you are saying, uh, uh, digital transfer, uh, digital transformation is huge for every organization, whether it is B2B or B2C. Uh, sales, uh, I'll say, has taken a backseat and marketing has become very, very powerful now. So in that situation, how the marketing is changed, how the marketing 
language has changed. What is your take on uh, the marketing role over the uh, uh, sales? I mean, I can look at our own organization and, and you know, we're an enterprise SaaS company. I would say um, our sales team is still very, very important mm-hmm. and they still um, are, are working in, in the you know, mid to later stays, stage of the customer funnel or the customer life cycle. Um, so we still need them, but everyone's at home. Nobody's flying around, nobody's having meetings, nobody's going to conferences. All of those things that we used to do face-to-face to connect with our customers, we are unable to do. And, and um, thank God we have the internet. I mean, imagine mm. if this happened, you know, 30, 40 years ago. I, this would be a really, we'd all, I guess, be watching network TV um, or reading the paper, listening to the radio. We'd be listening to the radio all day. Um, but again, it's the same answer. It's the, the companies that had moved ahead with digital transformation that were using you know, sophisticated technologies like AI and predictive analytics to understand customer intent. Um, even just having to run our conferences virtual, it was, it's a new world and, and understanding what technologies to use. Um, I think technology, again, is the differentiator between those organizations that were enabled and really equipped to very quickly move to 100% online. And again, we still need our salespeople. Our salespeople are still connecting one-on-one with our customers and with our prospects. I mean, we're a SaaS, we're an enterprise SaaS platform. It's it's, you know, the average sales price is at least six figures. There's a, it's quite a long sales cycle. Um, so marketing was probably never going to convert that deal, that lead into a, a sale without a sales team, but that's not true for everybody. And I think leveraging these, these newer technologies available to marketers, and we all know there are a zillion of them, but really leveraging them to, to understand what's going on in the market, to understand how audience preferences have changed and are changing, they're changing week by week, what's important, what figuring out new ways to connect with our audience when they're all online and you know, email marketing. Uh, so I'm on the board of a company called Litmus, which focuses yes. on um, you know, the demand side of the funnel and, and email marketing and suddenly, email has become a prior, you know, they used to say email is dead. That used to be a big mantra, which always was kind of confusing to me because email's the core of how a lot of us communicate. Um, but suddenly email's the way you have to connect, right? You're either connecting through um, display or, um, you know, paid search, but email is, is once you know that contact and you want to get directly to them, email becomes crucial in these times. And having an effective email strategy is really, really important. And so, so again, it's about technology. It's are you using AI to understand intent? Are you, do you have a, an effective email strategy where you're not bombarding and you're getting clear messages and you're sending and you understand what's performing and what isn't? Um, that I think is how marketing organizations have been able to really uh, stay afloat and continue to bring business to their companies. Alex, so how has been your experience? How have been, uh, you said that you're fiddling with certain things. So uh, how have you been uh, so far for last six months? What has been your experiments uh, with the technologies uh, without strategy also, uh, 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 you confess that you are not allowing your te- technical persons go and meet, uh, you know, br- uh, fix any, any, any challenges or even the sales guys go and meet their customers. What has been your experiments and your innovations? Yeah, we, we gave ourselves a few days to let the shock and awe of the situation settle in. I think in the beginning, some of us wanted to believe that this was going to be a two or three week situation and we'd all be back in the office. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously we all uh, look ahead and understand that that wasn't going to be the case. Um, And then as a, as a leadership team, 
we we did a lot of strategizing. Uh, we we looked at every function in our business. We looked at the goals that we had to hit. The the realizations that we came to were that at least in the short term, again, our solution is a six figure decision and a decent length of implementation. Mm -hmm. And we made a rational determination that it wasn't going to be the time that a lot of new prospects were going to raise their hand and start an evaluation process. Just like we were, everyone was assessing what was happening in the world and trying to figure out how they should move forward to respond. They weren't thinking, now's the time for a new field service management solution and I'm going to put a team together. And so in those first few months, we predicted that our top of funnel was going to be a challenge, mm -hmm. that it was going to be hard to connect with new buyers. And, um, and yet we didn't want to ease up on any of our goals. Uh, and so our, we, we made a decision to really focus on our customer base. Now we have a large customer base. Uh, we've been at this over 10 years. Um, so we're, we have a lot of customers and important customers that are, as I mentioned, in the center of the fight on the pandemic. And so we spent a lot of time on our customer data. We segmented and analyzed, analyzed our customer data. We looked at which companies are in industries that are on overdrive, like I mentioned, which companies are in industries where they might be slowing down, they might be furloughing um, their employees. We focused on number one, how can we help? Again, we help our customers keep the world running. So it wasn't focused on how can we maximize revenue at this time? It was more, how can we help right now? We're lucky we're, we're funded by Silver Lake, which is a private equity firm. And so we yeah. have access to a lot of resources. And so we're less focused on ourselves and more focused on how can we help being in the position that we're in. And um, so we put a lot of focus on those customers that are in the industries that became central to the fight. We also looked at how we could help everyone. So an example would be um, the talent pool. If you're in an industry that you're on overdrive, you need more field service technicians and you need educated, you need expert personnel to do that. And some of our com companies were putting ads for, they needed to hire or subcontract as many technicians as they could. We had other customers who were furloughing employees and, but they all are skilled in some way. And at, at the very least they know our software. So we created a job board where you could go in, you could post jobs. You could also have your employees who may be furloughed, go to that job site. A lot of these were temporary jobs that just needed to be filled during that period of time. And that was something that we could do because we have a network of different types of customers. But we also, you know, through that endeavor, we, we gave our Zinc tool, which you mentioned, the company that I was the CEO of that we, um, that ServiceMax acquired, mm -hmm. Zinc is a knowledge sharing collaboration platform for field service workers. So the ability to communicate out to technicians something that they need to know, a new piece of knowledge. The fact that there's now a checkbox next to the signature line, you got to communicate that to employees that don't typically communicate over email. Um, new procedures, new checklists, or just connecting. You got a new subcontractor from a different company and they haven't been through the full training and you want them to be able to do a video call with an expert while they're on the job so that they can better quickly solve that job. That's what Zinc does. And we gave Zinc away for free for the first three months of the pandemic to anyone, not even our customers, anyone. So again, focus on how can we help. And, and certainly from that, we, we connected with new companies. We built a closer connection with our customers. A lot of that translated into business for us. And, and it was really one of the ways that we kept hitting our goals through, through the pandemic. I think now we're in a different phase of the pandemic that a lot of com countries are, 
a lot more opened up than they were. Obviously some are shutting down again, which is frightening, but maybe this vaccine is promising. Okay. So it's moved back and people, you know, that the new top of funnel has picked up again. People are back to business. They're back mm -hmm. to evaluating technology. We're back to some of our more typical ways of generating top of funnel. Uh, but, but for about three to six months in there, we were really doing a lot of segmenting of understanding the data, trying to understand where our customers and prospects were during that time, and then meeting them there. Okay, uh, uh, sounds good. Uh, Stacey, uh, next uh, set of questions are around um, some technologies, uh, which used to be uh, uh, implemented by B2C companies, for example, RPA, artificial intelligence, uh, bot services, even social media, uh, you know, marketing tools. But these days, growing uh, trend, we can see that uh, B2B companies are also adopting that. I mean, you said rightly at the beginning that emailers have come back again, uh, you know, a tool for communication, which was uh, people had started writing obituary about uh, emails. It's not, it's going to die and only social media targeted marketing. But this technology, social media targeted marketing uh, uh, are being used by the B2B marketers these days. What is your take on that? And are you also into uh, utilizing tools around uh, RPA uh, uh, or artificial intelligence or even social media marketing, although your customers or the budget size uh, are really, really huge. Yes, we do. Uh, we, over the last year, have implemented Sixth Sense. So understanding, using predictive analysis to understand buyer intent, and that's been very, very successful for us. Okay. Uh, last year, we implemented Engageo, which is better understanding our customers and, and serving our, our sales team with intent information to help them decide what actions they should take. It also provides intelligence to our marketing team. Um, we are very active on social media. We don't use a specific social media monitoring. B2B, we have a very targeted market. Uh, we sell to companies that have field service teams and we sell to asset centric companies. So companies that have big or heavy pieces of equipment. So we're not like a consumer company where you might have millions of, of consumers that are engaging on social. Uh, but we, we do, I, I would say LinkedIn is probably our most fruitful uh, social platform and we use a lot of the LinkedIn tools mm -hmm. and we've worked very closely directly with LinkedIn to understand intent to serve our content to the appropriate audiences through LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has been a, a, a really great tool for us. It's a little harder with Facebook and Twitter are a little bit more challenging for us just with the market that we have. So I think you really do have to understand your market and you have to understand where they interacting and how to inter interact with them on LinkedIn. We just have a really, a lot of, uh, we just have better luck targeting our specific audience on LinkedIn. But uh, we, we've definitely been willing to be a leader and looking at these types of technologies and and leveraging AI and intent. And um, I have, a, I have a, a guy named Pat Oldenburg who runs Demand Marketing. I mentioned his name because he's amazing. Now I hope mm -hmm. everybody doesn't go try to hire him. But um, he's, he's done a really good job of just being very data focused, really wanting to understand what the latest technology is available that can help us move the needle and really using that data that we get from these platforms and turning that into, into results that go all the way through the funnel. All right, one more related question to it that oftentimes I've seen that social media, uh, um, uh, these days uh, uh, you will find a lot of data, a lot of information. Marketers go overboard, uh, they you know keep on sending um, so many data that the consumers uh, become very very confused. So, what is the kind of uh, what is the kind of strategy that the marketers 
should adapt in, in creating a balance between not go overboard. Yeah, well, I mean, that's another one where email, having an email tool like Litmus can really help you make sure that you're doing email right. I would say email is the one place that we get bombarded the most and it's the most probably frustrating. Mm -hmm. So if I'm on, if I'm on the internet and I see some display ads very regularly, that's probably a good thing. Uh, cause I'm not forced to do anything with that. It's more of a passive, you know, should I click on that link or not? I don't have to clean it out of my inbox like you do email. Um, and, and, and seeing it over and over again, sort of on the periphery of what I'm doing, I would say that's a really effective marketing strategy. Email, you have to be really careful because if you, um, I, I, there's actually one company I can think of just for my own self that like I bought a piece of apparel from their site and now I swear they email twice a day mm -hmm. and it gets to the point where I may really like that product, but I just start to get annoyed. Now, this isn't, this isn't new. This has been true since email started. Um, but I do think companies really need to think about that. They need to have a really good opt-in strategy. They have to have a good opt-out strategy they have to really segmenting who you're sending, making sure that you're sending compelling content and not bombarding. But also, again, it really does come down to the content. I mean, if you look across at the types of things that we're marketing, we are very rarely pushing features of our technology. We're much more pushing thought leadership and content and things that our audience craves and wants to receive. So I want to receive an article about how to empower my field service technicians with checklists. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a product feature, but we're not going to say, read about ServiceMax's checklists. We're going to say, how do you make sure that your technicians understand the new compliance protocols and have an easy way to adhere to them? And that's something that a, a buyer wants to click on. You know, again, using a tool like Litmus, you can really, you can test all of these in a small way. You can make sure that what you have is going to perform before you send it out. But I also think it's also just being thoughtful in your marketing strategy and really understanding your customer and your market and understanding what's compelling, what are the things that my audience wants to engage with. And that's what I'm going to put forth. And as soon as I start to become annoying, um, my technology is going to tell me that, and it's going to help me slow down and and go a little easier on my audience. Stacy, uh, next one is about uh, my my understanding uh, about the uh, industry's under understanding of the marketers. We call the marketers are the storytellers. You are also a storyteller. You do in bits and pieces and stitch it together and create a story in line with the organization goal. So how did you do? What did you do? Where did you start these things? How did you stitch all these pieces together and create a narrative for the organization goal, starting uh, from the pandemic? Of course, I mean, you have been doing it, but it would have been a, a kind of um, extra effort for you for the last six months. I, I think the most important aspect of storytelling is is empathy and mm -hmm. understanding where the audience is when you're trying to communicate something to them i think one of the reasons that i've been able to be a successful storyteller at service max is that i didn't necessarily come from the industry now I, I worked for Clarify. I've been in and around service teams and field service teams for a good part of my career, but I was never a field service director um, or a field service technician. And so my strategy for understanding a technology is I want to go to the use case. I want to go to, but what is it being used for? Don't tell me all the features. I want to know why they use it. Again, we'll go back to the checklist example. Don't tell me all, all the bells and whistles of a checklist feature. This is such a minute little feature, but it's, it's a good example. Tell me why does a technician need a checklist while they're on the job? And when you go to the use case and that aids in your own understanding, then you can tell it in a way 
that is more story based and is more use case based. Uh, and I think the more you talk to customers, the more you talk to prospects, the more you get out there and spend time. I encourage my marketing team to spend as much time as they possibly can talking to customers and talking to prospects in order to understand how to tell the story of what our solution can do for them. And if you stay focused on use cases, in some ways you're almost dumbing it down. You're bringing it to a place, if I, if I can understand what that feature does, because I need to understand it from a use case perspective, not a detailed functionality and feature perspective, then I can communicate it back in a, in a use case story kind of way and it really resonates more with the audience but i do think it starts with putting yourself in their shoes and understanding their world and so you can understand why does that technician need that technology tell it to me in a story and then i'll tell you how our solution can help in a story back excellent uh, the other thing uh, uh... I can see uh, that uh, there has been a contraction of the budget uh, for the uh, C-level executives from the management, uh, either the uh, CIOs, CISOs, or the CMOs are not able to explain or take their story uh, to the management and ask them the budget that, that they require. Probably your case is different because you came on board by virtue of the acquisition uh, of Jink. Uh, you already were in the leadership role. Uh, are you also uh, facing that kind of uh, challenge uh, from the uh, CFO or the management uh, that, okay, you have to do, with, do more with the less? What are the odds that my CFO is going to watch this interview before I answer that question? <laughs> I said probably pretty small. Um, and the answer is yes. If you look at the job of a CFO, their job is to uh, make sure, I was gonna say control spending, but that's maybe not fair to a CFO. Their job is really to optimize spending and to make sure that we're spending our money on the things that deliver the best return. And so it is all about ROI. And and you're right, I've been in a, in a C role for quite some time now. And I would say I'm fairly experienced at, at working with different CFOs. But I would say I, if you look at it as a collaborative relationship, we're both, we both want success for the company. And success for the company is not overspending on marketing and, and not becoming profitable because you've wasted a lot of money on marketing. And so I, I think it starts when I look at any challenging situation, I like to start with what's my role in it and what can I do to help solve it? And I think if marketers take that approach of what we're really trying to do is not have a successful marketing campaign. What we're really trying to do is have a successful company. And having a successful company doesn't mean throwing a bunch of marketing dollars away just so that you can get to that one campaign that was successful. Having a successful company means operating a, an effective business strategy. So I would say by the time it's already bubbled up through the organization to me, my, the organization has focused very much on the ROI. And we have a pretty defensible proposition to or to have a conversation with our CFO. And, um, and that's really how it works. I, I, I think we've, most of the time, by the time it gets to me and Simon, who's our CFO, our teams have already worked on it together all the way through. So including finance in the ROI evaluation process, I would say is very important. Um, not necessarily the CFO, but maybe it's the controller, maybe it's FP&A, and have them be part of, of 
understanding the ROI of a particular technology and have those teams be aligned at the lower levels. And by the time it comes to me and it comes to Simon, we've got both teams saying, yeah, we're really excited about this technology because it's going to deliver X returns on our investment. If it gets up to us and my team still wants it and the finance team isn't, isn't convinced, I'm going to have a harder time because it's probably not a foolproof ROI. And there certainly have been times that stuff has come up and Simon and I say, oh, maybe it's not the right time for whatever reason. But I would say, I can't think of a time that we have had to battle it out. I think when we both take the perspective of we're trying to do what's best for the company, and that doesn't necessarily mean overspending, it means spending wisely, then the decisions just come easier because you, you've started from the same ultimate goal. The last one is that a piece of advice that you can give out to the boarding uh, CMOs or the marketing leaders. Uh, how they can be successful, how can, uh, can they uh, optimally uh, utilize uh, the technology and the budget as well? Yes, I just touched on it. It's the same, and maybe it's been a thread through everything I've said, but it does go back to empathy. It does go back to not necessarily thinking about yourself and thinking about marketing first, but thinking about your audience first. And whether your audience is the CFO, whether your audience is your technology providers and vendors, whether the audience is your customers, is your prospects, you got to start by understanding them. What matters to them? What are their priorities? What is a win for them? What are their challenges? What are the use cases that, that matter to them? And... And from that perspective, then you can move forward with what you need to do in the role that you can play and how marketing can play. And there's lots of ways to have empathy. Certainly one way is to spend time with your audiences. And right now it's mostly via Zoom, but making those connections. And the other way is through technology, through AI, through, through um, you know, through the data that all of your, you have a big marketing stack and every one of those tools gives you data, really taking the time to understand that data, that is empathy, that is understanding your audience. And that puts you in the best position to, uh, to help them and to serve what they need. And by meeting their needs and their goals, that's how you can meet your own. All right, Stacy, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, one word if you can take uh, from this conversation that you bring a lot of empathy into your activities and uh, feel like other people in your organization, even in your customer organization. Thank you very much, Stacy, for uh, sparing so much of time. Have a good day and uh, it's quite early and stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. You too. Have a good night. Thank you.